Hi, I'm glad you're here. Let's paint a little southwestern scene today. I'm Wilson Bickford. I'm going to be using some of my signature oil painting products to do this little painting demonstration for you. This is going to be a painting right from one end to the other. Something that you'll be able to do with just a few colors and a few tools out of my product line. I'm going to be using one of my uh, signature canvas panels today, which are MDF core, very warp resistant, really nice professional quality panels. And I'm thinking of some sort of a southwestern scene. Um, on my palette today I have cerulean blue, cobalt blue hue, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, dioxazine purple, and titanium white. And I'm going to be using some of the uh, Wilson Bickford uh, fast flow white medium that I've got over here on a disposable palette, just a little puddle poured out here. I'll take my two inch scenery brush and I'm going to lubricate the canvas with a nice thin coat of this white medium. This will make my colors very blendable. Everything I put on the canvas from here on out. Now this scrubs on a little hard because the canvas is dry. Once the canvas is wet with this medium, the colors will flow right on. We can get nice soft gradations and tonal variations where we want them and soft edges. And unfortunately, I've never been to the Southwest, but I really like the color schemes that you see out there, a lot of blues and oranges. Um, if you're not aware of uh, color wheel in necessarily, um, orange and blue are complementary colors on a color wheel, which means they are supposedly, the theory is, they are visually appealing when used together. And I think that's part of the appeal of the southwestern colors. There's a lot of oranges and blue sky and that sort of thing. And they're just very visually appealing. So I'm just going to scrub in a nice thin coat with this two inch scenery brush. As you see me flicking hairs off, it's just that this is a brand new brush and it's shedding a little bit, as all new brushes do. Okay, let's get right into this. I'm gonna take some cerulean blue into the dirty white brush. And I'm just gonna leave my palette laying here for convenience sake. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of cerulean blue. Atmospheric perspective says that anything in the distance is a lighter value, that includes the sky. So if the sky is a long ways away, the lower sky on the lower horizon will be a little bit lighter value. Value simply means how light or dark a color is. So I'm going to have this be quite pale down here so it looks like it's a long ways away. The sky that's more over your head will be the darker sky which will be higher on this canvas. So I'm going to switch over here and take some of the cobalt blue which is a little darker. I want a deeper, darker blue here at the top of the canvas. That will make this area down here at the horizon appear farther away. I'm going to go even stronger yet. The nice part of painting is you can adjust your colors as you go. Blue is my favorite color, so I'm going to pour some blue on here. Now, I want these to melt together, so that's where that white base coat comes in handy that I put on earlier. I can just kind of do a crisscross stroke and just weave those colors together. I'm going to want this a little bit darker yet at the top sky. That's an easy adjustment. Painting is like making soup. You always have to test it and taste it and see where, you, where you're at, how much more salt or pepper or whatever you need. So now that I've tasted that, I'm going to put a little more blue in there. Oils are very easy to uh, change in midstream. Um, acrylics are drying while you're doing this. Nothing against acrylics. I use acrylics too. But you have to have your game on for that to get in here and get the blending done quickly with acrylics. Oils, you can always change your mind and just do it at any point. So that makes it pretty easy. I'm going to end up taking my fan brush and I'm going to take some white, little touch of the burnt sienna just to warm it up a little bit. Slightly orange. Burnt sienna is actually a dark orange. So I'm going to put a little bit of sienna with that white just to make it like a cream color. And I'm, I'm looking at big cumulus clouds here today. Now I'm going to come back and highlight these differently. But I basically just kind of use the corner of the brush and just do a little wiggle jiggle with the brush. Which drives my students nuts most of the time because they have a hard time duplicating that. But it's just... Uh, that I'm not doing anything too specific. Now I'm picking up blue off the brush as I do that, so I'm going to keep wiping that off. But basically, you just need to be random. Um, 
A lot of people give a fan brush a bad rap and they say, oh, those fan brushes are no good for anything. That's because people tend to do this and they stamp with them. And you get stuff that looks like eyebrows. I don't do that. Um, if you hadn't seen me do that, you wouldn't know that I used a fan brush to do it. That's because I've gotten pretty good over the years at hiding my tracks so it's not blatantly obvious what tool I use to do whatever effect I'm after. That's half the battle with painting. You want to kind of do it in a way that doesn't necessarily give away how you did it. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Um, now I want to put a little more light on the tops of some of those. So I'm just going to swish this out in some paint thinner. And I'm going to take pure white this time, maybe just a tad of that white base coat to thin it down a little bit so it'll stick to the canvas a little easier. Thin paint will stick over this thicker paint. By the way, these paints are all really thick and pasty, almost like caulk. They're very thick and they're made for the purpose of putting wet paint on top of wet paint. If you put down a heavy, thick underlayer, you can get subsequent layers to stick to it by thinning them down. Now I can thin paint down either with that white medium or I can actually dip in and get a few drops of paint thinner on the brush. It'll do the same thing. See, I got some warm tones in there from the Sienna. Kind of subtle, but I didn't really want it to set right up and scream. I'll put a little bit of highlight on the top of this. As I'm highlighting, I'm looking for two things. I'm trying to make it a little more interesting as far as the shape goes. And uh, I want to get a little bit brighter, a little more contrast. See, if I fade the bottoms of those clouds away, they look like they're anchored to the sky and connected there like they should be. Notice how often I'm wiping the brush, too, um, because you're going to pick up a lot of the blue sky color as you do this. Okay, now way off in the distance. I've heard of it. Like I said, I've never seen it, but I know there's a place out here that they call the Painted Desert, and I'm assuming it's because it looks like it's painted. I've seen photos of it, so I kind of know what it looks like. I'm just going by wrote here and by uh, memory basically. If I want to soften that out I would use my one inch mop brush. It's very soft and if I use a light touch I can kind of minimize any brush marks. Some people like to leave the brush marks. I tell my students all the time uh, Van Gogh would have put more brush marks in here and Da Vinci would have blended it a little more. Uh, Van Gogh's work is nothing but big thick bold brush strokes. So there's no right or wrong in that. It depends on what you want to show and what your own personal style and feeling about it is. The second soften that right out and take some of the harshness out of that with my mop brush. It's excellent for that. Okay, I'm going to come in and I'm going to paint some far away desert way back here somewhere. And I'm going to put in different colors. You'll see that I'm going to start out maybe with that. And then I'm going to take a little bit of the dioxazine purple, which is really, really strong. So I'm just going to blend that right into the Sienna. And they don't call it the Painted Desert for nothing. There's all these colors, bands of color in it. When you look at photos of this, there's bands of color in there, which makes it very interesting. I'm going to go a little stronger purple here and there. And see, I'm just kind of literally weaving the colors together bumping them into each other and not looking for stripes necessarily. I'm letting them melt into each other. I'm going to go back with a little more sienna, something a little stronger, more orangey as it gets closer. And the desert isn't all just uh, siennas and purples and that sort of thing. Sometimes you see little touches of green. I don't have green on my palette, but as we all know, if I take some blue, I'll take the cobalt blue and a little bit of this yellow ochre, I can make something that's green. I'm going to put a few little touches of that in there. Now see, if I leave that horizon as a hard line, it kind of tends to bring it a little closer. So, you know, sometimes you'll see the horizon as a hard edge like that. It depends on the atmosphere of the given day. And if I want to push that back a little farther, I can take my nice soft mop brush and watch this disappear. I'm just trying to soften that very top edge of that. Notice how that makes it indistinct. It shoves that back a million miles away. Look how far away that is. The whole thing with painting is you're trying to show distance and depth on a flat surface where you really don't have any. 
So you always exaggerate what you can and play up certain things to, to make that happen. And I'm going to go back to this uh, two inch scenery brush, even though it's got blue on it. Blue is the complement to orange, like I told you, and that will uh, gray my oranges down somewhat. So I'm just going to wipe this off. I'm going to take a little bit of white, a little bit of the sienna, maybe a tad of the yellow. And I just want something for sandy color up here in the foreground. Now it makes sense to switch back to a bigger brush rather than try to use this little fan brush to cover all that foreground. That's why I like these big brushes. You can get right in and go for it. A lot of people don't think of these as being necessarily art brushes, but they are. It depends on the context in which you use them. I'm going to take some purple and sienna and just to change the flavor. Make this a little more interesting. Art isn't always about being absolutely literal. A lot of times I play with color just to make it more interesting one way or another. Okay, so far there's our desert. Now you'll see uh, in the southwest they have what they call buttes. Isn't that a butte? Is <laughs> my standard joke. But I'm going to take some uh, sienna, some of this purplish mixture I just used. I want this to be a little more faint. This is my number six round brush. I'm going to put a butte way off in the distance here. My plan is to put a bigger one, more defined here. I want this one to be a little lighter than the one I'm going to put in the foreground so it's far away. And these are just these really strange looking rock formations that creep up out of the ground that kind of look like this. Very unique. It kind of makes you wonder how they got there. I guess it's something to do with the glaciers going through and carving out or the river, I guess. At one time, way back a million years ago, but they're very unique. I'm just going to soften the bottom of that. I'm not going to worry about too much for highlighting and all that because I want it to look far away. See, this area looks very far away as opposed to what I'm going to do next. Now, there's a couple ways to approach this. If I don't think this is going to stay dark enough for me, I think it could, I think it will, but if I'm not sure of it, I can take my wipe off tool and I can actually remove some of the excess paint. So let's do that. Um, I'm just doing this from memory, like I said. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see this really well on camera just yet. I'm just carving out a shape of one of these closer buttes just to remove some of the excess paint and it helps me kind of get this laid out on my canvas where I want it. Now that's the round pointed end where I can kind of score a line. If I use this flatter end that looks like a little squeegee, that makes it perfect for just actually removing all that excess paint out of there. And just wipe the tool off as you pick up the excess. I know you're thinking I'm losing my mind. You're going to say, that doesn't look very good. Well, give me just a minute. I promise it'll get better. Most paintings don't look all that great in the beginning stages anyway. They start out kind of abstract. And it depends on how much you want to refine it and how far you want to go with it and what they ultimately appear like. Okay. I want to come back with something quite dark, so I'm going to use uh, dioxazine purple and burnt sienna. I am going to thin this down just a little bit with a couple drops of thinner, so it'll flow off my brush a little easier. Actually, I'm going to incorporate a little bit of Van Dyke brown I've got right here, too. I kind of forgot that I was going to put that on my palette, but I've got it right here, so no harm done. I want to get something a little darker. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. Checking the value. Value just means how light or dark a color is. And any painting you do is just a constant battle between light and dark and hard edges and soft edges. If you strip painting down to the bare essentials, that's what it amounts to. Hard edges, soft edges, lights and darks, and cool and warm temperatures. See the sky, and this is blue. It's a very cool color. All these browns are going to be, and oranges are going to be much warmer. See, by making this value darker, it brings it much closer than that distant butte. 
You keeping up with this? I hope so. This isn't hard at all. Um, obviously, I have painted scenes like this before, <clears throat> so I can kind of do them from memory. If you're painting something like this, you're probably going to want a photograph to look at to go by. That's fine. That's how everybody starts. Once you get to a point where you've done something a few times, it gets really easy. Okay, I'm just going to switch over to my fan brush just because this brush is a little small for what I want to do right now. So I just switch over. I use a big brush where I can. I'm just going to bring that down. If you're new to painting, don't be afraid to give it a whirl. You can't really uh, mess up too badly. Don't be afraid to, you know, a lot of people don't start because of the fear of failure. You're going to learn more from your mistakes than you do any other way. Each time you pick up the brush, you're going to be a little bit in a little bit better shape than you were the previous time. You'll learn a little bit every time you pick the brush up. Okay, now I'm going to let this melt down into the sand, so I'm, I want a soft edge. I was talking earlier about soft and hard edges. This horizon line is very soft, looks far away. This edge is very hard on the butte, so it looks close. And I want a soft edge here, so this literally just kind of melts down into the sand and becomes connected. All right, that's looking pretty good, don't you think? Yeah. All right, I'm going to take my uh, small painting knife. Now, these buttes typically have a lot of uh, orange tones in them. So I'm actually going to take some burnt sienna. I'm going to try that by its, uh, maybe not. I was going to say, I was going to try that by, my, by itself, but I think it's going to be a little too dark on its own. I'll put a little bit of white with it. And I'm going to alter the colors anyway as I do this. But if I pull this out in a little pile, flatten that out, and then wipe the excess off, I can cut through and get a little ridge right on the edge of that blade, like that. And I'm going to come in and just deposit that. I'm going to go just a tad lighter yet. Um, it's not quite standing out as light as I want. Like, again, it's like making soup. I had to test it. Taste it up here. It needs a little more salt. In this case, a little more white. It's always deceiving because you're always mixing it on your background color of your palette, whether you got a wooden palette or a white palette or one of the gray palettes, and then you're putting it against color on your canvas, so it always reads differently. So you literally just have to kind of check it on your painting. And these have these nice, distinct ridges in them, layers of the rock. And I'm no geologist, I'll be the first to admit that. So I don't know why it is, all, all I know is that it is. These ridges tend to go vertically down to about here to this little pedestal, and then they tend to go horizontally. Now, I don't know how Mother Nature did that, how she formed them, so I'm not going to even go there and try to tell you how or why. I only know that by looking at photos, that's how it is. So I will leave that to the scientists and geologists. Having said all that, I'm going to come through and start doing them this way. Once it gets down to that little collar, that little pedestal, the grain tends to run this way. They're really unique structures, really amazing formations, actually. Very interesting. And I'm just going to let those kind of dissipate as it goes down into the sand. Eventually, they get overtaken by the sand, and they just kind of even out into the ground and become connected. All right, it's looking pretty good, I think. I'm going to lighten that up just a whisker. I'm going to take a little more white, and this time a little bit of the yellow ochre. Maybe just a touch of that previous sienna color. Now, I could go very orangey on this. I could use some of my cad red light. If I had that on the palette, sometimes I go really bright with it with that tone, which is a very light, bright orange. I think today I'm going to leave it a little more subdued. I tell my students all the time, every time you paint, you're going to paint differently. Um, you, whatever's in you at that given moment when you've got that brush in your hand is what's going to come out of you. 
right now I'm thinking that this is probably going to satisfy me for today. But don't be afraid to play with your colors. That's what it's all about. Get some color out and try different things. Um, nobody can tell you that your way is wrong. You do it your way and what makes you happy. That's what painting is all about is self-expression. It's not expression of somebody else. You only have to account for yourself. I'll put a little extra highlight. See how that extra highlight just kind of brings that out a little more? That's looking pretty good, I think. Now, don't you think you could do this? I think you can. It's not that difficult. Um, it takes a little practice. Like I said, you're probably going to want a photo to look at of something, no matter what your subject is. Okay, that's looking pretty decent. This is actually a, a formation in Monument Valley, what I'm doing here. I guess I forgot to mention that. Um, it's actual rock formation. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to take my fan brush. I'm going to rinse it out. I've got just uh, paint thinner in this pail. Rinse that right out. I'm going to take something a little darker. I'll use Van Dyke Brown. And I'm just going to mix it into the stuff that's already on my palette. You'll see a lot of times I just incorporate one color into the next. That gives you a better chance of having color harmony rather than all these disjointed colors that aren't related. They all kind of mix together and become harmonious with each other. Now I've thinned this down with paint thinner with the intentions of taking my fan brush like this and if I snap the bristles like that you get these little dots. This is called spattering which gives you a lot of gravelly, gritty texture for roads and paths. and A very useful technique to know. Sometimes I use it for falling snow in a snow scene or you can use it for gravel on a road like I said or stars in a nighttime sky. When I'm doing the gravel texture like that I don't really just leave it. I smear it a little bit. Which means I'm going to take my fan brush now. now if you don't want to get your finger dirty you can actually use the knife. I just usually use my finger. Some people prefer to flick it with the knife keeps their fingers out of the paint but I'm a firm believer that painting isn't fun unless you get some on you once in a while so I'm not afraid of it. I'm going to wipe this off and I'm not going to use the end like you normally would a fan brush. This is very coarse if I do it this way. But if I use the back side of the brush I get a much lighter touch and I just want to smear that a little bit. So it doesn't look like just hard dots but it looks like little divots and depressions in the sand and it looks more realistic rather than just little dots on there. See how that softens it somewhat? Now it looks like there's texture in it. Speaking of texture, I'm going to go back with my one inch texture brush. And these are a little more coarse than the uh, scenery brushes and they're made for texture. That's why I named them a texture brush. I'm going to take some burnt sienna, maybe just a touch of purple fair amount of texture on the brush, as, uh, on the palette. See, I'm using enough paint to actually get texture on the brush. And the, Don't match your brush bristles together. Leave them nice and open. If I come in I can kind of get this rough growth and sagebrushy looking stuff. Um, since this is the foreground we can afford to be darker and uh, more defined so don't be afraid to make it stand out three-dimensionally but by putting more texture in it. So I'm using quite a bit of paint. If you look at this area back here it's very smooth and blended. It's no texture in it at all. I want texture in this stubbly grassy looking stuff. And see basically this whole painting is just uh, kind of the orange and blue and the brown. Speaking of the orange I'm going to wipe that off. And I'm going to take a little bit of straight sienna. Load the brush the same way. Quite a bit of paint. And I'm going to put some of that orangey texture in here as well. Just let it, let it fade away in the background so there's just very little out there. I'm not going to put a lot. I want that to look distant. See how that kind of brings that much closer with all this foreground texture. All right. I know for a fact if it was a nice clear day like that, there's going to be a buzzard or two on the wing out there somewhere. 
So I'm going to take my number two script liner. And I'm just, again, I'm just going to take some of the dark stuff that's already on my palette, some of this brown and purple mixture. And I'm really thin that down with paint thinner, and I'm going to roll that to a point. And this is our focal area. If you walked into the room and had not seen this painting before, and your eye went to that painting, you're kind of drawn right there. It's because that's the largest thing, it's the darkest thing against the lightest background. There's the most contrast to that light sky with that dark view. So I wouldn't want to put my bird way over here or way over here. I want him kind of in the vicinity of where my focal point is. So I'm going to say, there's a bird there, maybe one here. Notice I'm making them different sizes. The smaller one looks farther away. If I wanted to say there's one kind of coming up closer to us, I could afford to make him bigger. Maybe, maybe I'll balance him out and put him over here. See, if I make this one bigger yet, he looks even closer than that one. So you get a sense of scale and distance on it. All right, I think that's a wrap. Did you, did you like that project? Don't be afraid to try this out. Try these signature paints and brushes. You'll see that you, they're going to work for you. It just takes a little bit of practice. Watch a few of the free art lessons, and uh, don't be afraid to give it a whirl. And check out wilsonvickford.com for my schedule and more free lessons. Take care until next time.